Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first lecture of my course ES369N, Sustainability Issues in Energy. My name is Hugh Daigle. I'm an associate professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm putting all of these lectures online in an attempt to disseminate some of this information and provide education for people who are interested and really just as a way of helping myself make these lecture notes. So I hope that you enjoy this and uh, let's get started. Today's lecture is going to be the first of unit one, which is about defining sustainability with respect to energy. So for this first unit, uh, I have some recommended reading here. There's a couple of books that I'll be referring to. The first one is by uh, my colleague, Dr. Carrie King, who is uh, over in the Energy Institute here at UT. And it's called The Economic Superorganism, Beyond the Competing Narratives on Energy Growth and Policy. Uh, this is a really good book. It gets at some of the economic arguments for energy and sustainability, and I highly recommend it. Uh, the second one is one that many of you may already be aware of and familiar with. It's um, uh, David McKay's book, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. Um, I have a print copy uh, because I'm old fashioned like that, but you can also download it for free at withouthotair.com. So I highly recommend you check that out. And finally, um, the book by Tester et al, uh, Sustainable Energy Choosing Among Options. This is the group from MIT. And this is a very good reference for understanding energy production and how to make it more sustainable. So today's lecture is called Energy is Good, and I'm going to walk you through some of the basics of why energy is good and why we need it and why we should continue to supply it to people in the future in some form or another. So I'll start with a quote from Kerry King's book. So the gist of this, and you can read the text here, I'm not going to read it to you because that's bad. Um, you know, bad lecture protocol <laughs> etiquette. Um, but, you know, 250 years ago, we had a small world population. A lot of the energy we got was from, from the sun, either, you know, as, as uh, mainly plants or food or animals that eat plants. Um, and everything, economic transactions went slowly. Now, if you fast forward to today, we've got a large world population and most of our energy sources are fossil energy. And uh, everything goes much faster. You know, we can move around the world faster. The rate of economic transactions is faster. And so if our overall goal is economic expansion and having more people uh, living on Earth, then basically we can just keep doing what we've been doing, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so this is really the question. Should we just keep doing what we've been doing because it seems to be working? Or is there something wrong with it? Well, let's talk about that a little more. So the key point of today's lecture is that energy is good. Here's a figure from Carrie's book. It's a plot of expenditure on energy by type of fuel as a percentage of gross domestic product, GDP. And this is just for the United Kingdom, or it was just it's just for England prior to uh, 1707. But what you can see here is that going back to the year 1300, a significant amount at times up to 100% of GDP was uh, spent on, uh, on energy. And so this included wood for cooking and heating, fodder for animals. And then this is the most interesting to me, it's food for people doing physical labor, you know, farmers and, and other laborers, there was very little in the way of mechanized labor back then. It was all mostly done by people. Now, one thing that you notice is that starting around the mid 1700s, we start to see fossil energy sources crop up more here. And as a result, the overall percentage of GDP that's being spent on energy goes down significantly to much less than 20%, even less than 10%, I think. And there's um, a reason for this, and it has to do with the onset of the Industrial Revolution. So 1769, James Watt patented, patented his steam engine. And following that, you see this tremendous increase in coal, and then later on petroleum. Um, 
which is being used to power this industrial machinery. Um, fossil energy sources are extremely energy dense. You get a lot more energy per unit mass from them than you do from um, wood, for instance, uh, or other types of biomass. And as a result, you can produce more energy cheaper. And so the upshot of this is that the Industrial Revolution in the United Kingdom correlated with reduced physical labor in favor of power from fossil fuels and an overall large decrease in expenditures on energy. Now, here's similar data. Uh, this is expenditures on energy for fuel purchased for services as a percentage of GDP. So this is what you're purchasing the fuel for, not necessarily just what the fuel is. Okay, so you can see, again, going back to um, the late medieval period and um, the, the Renaissance, uh, a lot of uh, energy is being purchased for power by human labor. You know, that's really, just really significant to me. Um, but then again, starting at the industrial revolution here, you can see that that, particular category declines a significant amount. And even though we've got more categories here that we're purchasing fuel uh, you know, energy for, the overall expenditures as a percentage of GDP are a lot lower. Again, there's that 1769 James Watt date. Now we can look at similar data for the United States. This just goes uh, back to, um, I think 1926 or so. Um, this is spending as a percentage of GDP, and this is uh, food and energy. And again, you can see that the sum of food plus energy, that spending has gone down a lot, even over the course of the 20th to early 21st century. Um, energy costs have declined a little bit. Food costs have declined a lot. And so overall, in the U.S. and the United Kingdom, we're spending much less on food and energy than we were even 100 years ago. Now, how does this uh, correspond to quality of life? Well, one way we can measure quality of life is in terms of average life expectancy. So I went and pulled this data from gapminder.com. It's a great uh, data clearinghouse. And here we've got energy use in terms of uh, kilograms of oil equivalent per capita uh, plotted against average life, life expectancy. And this is the most recent data from 2013. You can see that there's a broad trend here. You don't see a lot of data points down here in the bottom right, and you don't see a lot of data points up here in the top left. And so broadly speaking, you can say that um, countries where you are using more energy per capita generally tend to have longer life expectancy, whereas those that are using lower energy uh, per capita have a shorter life expectancy. And you can break it out into individual countries. You can see Iceland um, up here, long life expectancy, a lot of energy use. The US is kind of in the middle of the pack up there. And then South Sudan and Mozambique um, are down here with lower life expectancy and much lower energy use. Now, what if we look at how this has changed over the years? We have these data available going back to 1959. And there are fewer data points for 1959. A lot of the data are biased towards Western European uh, nations plus uh, South Korea and Japan and, and a few others. But overall, you can see um, life expectancy for most of these countries has increased uh, since 1959. Um, and what's most interesting is that the increase is most significant for the high energy users. So higher energy use appears to be correlated not just with higher life expectancy now, but a more pronounced increase in life expectancy um, over the second half of the 20th century. Now, here we can plot another set of data. This is energy use again on same x-axis, but this is GDP, and this is inflation adjusted in 2010 US dollars. So there's a very good correlation here in the 2013 data. And also you can draw a line through the 1959 data. There's obviously, again, a smaller data set. So it's hard to make inferences about the differences between these, uh, these two data sets. But overall, you can see that higher energy use uh, seems to correlate to increases in GDP. You can see going from this uh, cluster of, of yellow squares to the red dots, um, whereas lower energy use is correlated with lower GDP. You can draw some trend lines through here. I'm not sure that the differences between these are really significant, but it's just interesting to note. 
So overall, you can see just to conclude here, more energy use trans, you know, correlates with longer life expectancy, more improvement in life expectancy, as well as higher GDP and greater improvement in GDP. Okay, now how has um, the consumption of energy worldwide changed since 1800? Well, you can see that back in the 19th century, uh, we started out mostly consuming biomass. So this is you know, burning wood and other things like that um, for, for heat and for cooking and that sort of thing. Coal really took over and by the uh, start of the 20th century, coal was the dominant energy source. Now you can see um, that coal and biomass together make up less than 40% of world energy consumption. Oil and gas are the majority, and then we've got other types of sources, including hydroelectric, nuclear, and other renewable sources. But overall, we are still mainly burning things to uh, produce uh, uh, to produce energy. Okay, so everything from gas on down—that's all stuff that we are burning. So to conclude here, uh, we see that energy consumption is positively correlated with the quality of life if we use life expectancy and per capita GDP as reasonable proxies for quality of life. And growth in the use of fossil fuels is correlated with less need for physical labor and overall reductions in energy costs, uh, both of which I think you know, any reasonable person could argue are good things in the long run. So in our next lecture, what we're going to look at is some of the environmental issues surrounding uh, both the use of fossil fuels and uh, renewable energy sources. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, unfortunately, in the energy world. And we need to acknowledge some of the issues we have with all different sources of energy. Thanks for coming to this lecture. I hope that you've enjoyed it. And visit my uh, YouTube channel so you can find uh, more lectures as they become available.